So we are live on Facebook and we've got um, some guests today. We've got Morgan uh, Mann, who is the Community Relations Director for the Door County Library System. We have Janine Brennan, who is our Interim Branch Manager at the Egg Harbor Library. And then our special guest today is Dave LaLuzerne. Dave, welcome. Hello. <coughs> So Dave and I work together on the uh, Every Day is Earth Day Festival, and I've gotten to know him um, pretty well through that. And um, his talent, other than arranging events, is also he's an herbalist. So with that, I'll let you take it away. Well, welcome, everyone, to my home here in Ellison Bay. I think Dave, all of us are probably anxiously awaiting the real arrival of spring here. I think there's been some signs showing up already. Uh, I know that the uh, I, the daffodils and tulips are up, and and uh, some of the wild plants are starting to show their their early leaves. So that's nice. This actually here is a scene from uh, the Ellison Bluff, one of the be most beautiful panoramas I think in Door County, a springtime panorama to start out with. So my name is Dave Lalazern, and interestingly enough. This is my namesake plant. This is this is Luzerne, La Luzerne. This is French word for alfalfa, and so I think that uh, looking back at my origins, you know, La Luzerne, I think the the idea of alfalfa kind of set me in the direction of interest in herbs. Uh, when I was young, I I uh, grew up on Kinnikinnick Avenue in uh, in Milwaukee. And kinnikinnick is actually the Indian word for the herbs that they use for smoking. Because uh, prior to the uh, advent of white men in the area, the uh, Native Americans used different herbs to smoke. And one of them was uh, over ursi or kinnikinnick. Uh, and actually kinnikinnick is a, is a combination of different herbs, including over ursi. And we'll talk a little bit about over ursi or bearberry a little bit later. And I also went to a uh, pharmacy school um, and when I went to pharmacy school at UW, I often, um, I was interested in the idea that so many of the drugs that we have, that we used to take, came originally from the plant kingdom. So I became more and more interested in plants. So today we're gonna to talk about herbs and, and in particular the spring herbs, ones that are, are gonna, you're gonna be able to find growing here in Door County. So, but first I wanted to just make a little statement about herbs. Uh, herbal medicine in its holistic sense recognizes humanity as an expression of life. Livened with life force and herbs can work with this whole being, not just specific symptoms. They do function through biochemical interactions and specific applications, but they do so in a way that augments the vital processes of the body. On the biochemical level, the numerous ingredients in an herb work in a synergistic way with elements involved in the process that chemotherapy would not even consider to be active. If we just looked at herbs as a source of valuable chemicals, we would limit their healing power. For beyond the physical level, they can also work on the level of the life force. As they heal our bodies, they may also heal our hearts and minds, for they open the body to a clear flow of integrating and synergizing vital energy. And I think this is something to keep in mind as we go through this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, that Herbs are really much more complex than drugs and a lot different than drugs. So let's, let's define what, what is an herb. An herb is any plant or plant part that is used for its therapeutic value. Herbs are complex mixtures of organic and inorganic compounds. Yarrow. Uh, is a good example of that. This is a plant. Uh, this is, yarrow will be coming up soon. Uh, the, it doesn't flower until later, perhaps the end of June or beginning of July, but that'll be coming up pretty soon. But it is, it's a combination of many different compounds and they have many different properties. This is the thing that sets herbs apart from drugs is that they're complex compounds. They're not just simple chemicals. And I think that the nice thing about herbs is that because of their complexity, they work well with our complexity. Our bodies are hugely complex. And there's a lot of functions that have to occur every day for us to, to, be, to survive. So as you can see with yarrow, 
It has an anti-inflammatory, it's antipyretic, anti-rheumatic, antiseptic, antispasmodic, astringent, carminative, a cicatricent, which is something that helps to heal wounds, diaphoretic, digestive, expectorant, all sorts of things. The, the interesting, one of the interesting things about uh, to know about yarrow is if you're out walking in the woods and you have a have a chance, you know, you get cut and you start to bleed. The, the yarrow, the, the leaves, especially leaves crushed up and put on a wound will stop the bleeding within less than a minute. So it's a really good first aid type of herb to know about when you're out, if you're out in the woods or walking where the, where the at least where the uh, yarrow grows, which is mostly in wetlands areas, but uh, on the edge of woods. So herbal science is the art and science of, um, of, of uh, using herbs for promoting health and preventing and treating illness. So the, the, the important thing to keep in mind here, oh, oh. oh I can't advance my herb thing right now, wait a minute. Uh, here, sorry about this. My file is not advancing right now. Well, well, here, do we want to, um, why don't we stop the screen share and then, oh, there it goes, there. there it goes. Okay, it goes, all right, there it goes. All right, those are so, the next thing we want, we want to talk about is how should I take these herbs, the dosage forms. And I think this is an important thing to keep in mind because, um, you know, so often uh, when we talk about taking medicine, we talk about taking a pill or a liquid of some sort uh, or tablets and, um, and they're isolated chemicals. So when we take herbs, we're, we're think, we should think about them more at like they're like there are uh, food. And, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is you are what you eat. So it's important to get a lot, you know, one way to incorporate herbs into your everyday life is to take them with food that you eat. And so here's a lot of examples of, of food, of course, that has herbs in it. So one of the oldest traditions, of course, of using herbs in the food is Ayurveda. And curries are a good example of that. It was Ayurveda, the 3,000 year plus old Indian health science, which first introduced the art of personalized cooking. In fact, it went a step further by demonstrating how not only what you eat makes a difference, but how it is prepared also makes a difference. And curries are the, are the most well-known part of Indian cuisine. Most Indian dishes are usually curry based, prepared by adding different types of vegetables, lentils, or meats in the curry. The content of the curry and the style of preparation varies from region to region. And in fact, you can see there's a, a large, these are the, some of the herbs that are, that are used in different curries. And the way in Ayurveda, they use the curries as a, a means of treatment, as a means of health care. So they would, instead of taking an isolated chemical, uh, an isolated herb even, or an isolated chemical, you would incorporate these herbs into your food. And so a lot of the suggestions that I have, that a lot of the herbs that we'll be talking about today, I'll be giving you suggestions how you can incorporate them into your diet which is one of the best ways to take herbs. So one of the things that I've been doing for the last few years is I've been hosting a dandelion dinner. And dandelion is a, is a most useful herb and also a food. And uh, this was one of the first dandelion dinners that I attended myself, I went to. Uh, this was a, ser a, a serving of the food. And the uh, broccoli has a dandelion pesto on it. The uh, dandelion greens were, were boiled and, and, and then put, uh, had vinaigrette put on them. Uh, there was a dandelion leaf lasagna was part of the meal. And then for dessert, there was a, uh, there was a dandelion blossom cake, uh, as you can see there. And this was served with dandelion blossom wine. So let's talk a little bit more about dandelion, but first, Flowers in the sunshine or during a shower. Dandelion. 
Dandelion be popping up everywhere. But they don't care. Dandelion, they never take a vacation. They always popping up without invitation. Dandelion, there's always enough to share. <laughs> the store where the gardeners go to buy me some dandelion seeds man behind the counter said son don't you know you don't have to plant them they grow like a weed wow dandelions they don't have to be planted why does everyone take them for granted dandelions they're as special as you and me Get up and go is gone. You need some vitamins, some remedies, some tonic or some tea. Well, look out in your lawn. You got dandelions by the bunch of the bowlful. Eat them all up. They'll make you feel soulful. Dandelions, they're special as you and me. Dandelions, they're good for your liver. Eat them all up. They make you jump up and shiver. Dandelion, they'll make them all clear at you. <laughs> Dandelion, blow those seeds and make wishes for money, world peace, or lots of sweet kisses. Dandelions, they'll make your wishes come true. So I found that song on a children's tape by Lisa Atkinson, and then I added the medicinal verses to it because, you know, we can talk about dandelions, we need to talk about the whole thing. So, all right. That's uh, my friend uh, from North Carolina, Doug Elliott. He work, lives on a small farm. He grows lots of his uh, vegetables and raises chickens and uses lots of herbs. And dandelion is really, it is a good food. If you think about dandelions, it's one of the first plants that come up in the spring. And so, you know, years ago, before we had grocery stores in every neighborhood and, and, and where people were living, especially up here, perhaps in Door County or Native Americans, you know, they need after a long winter when they didn't have any fresh vegetables or fresh foods, dandelions was a was a good herb. And and the, the, the dandelion leaves, the dandelion roots, the dandelion flower all have uh, nutritional and medicinal value. Leaves are di diuretic, especially with water retention due to heart problems. The bitter root compounds stimulate the appetite and promote good digestion. Bitter, bitter herbs are something that you really should be aware of because uh, bitter, bitter herbs help to improve your digestion and improve your appetite as well. And uh, in fact, you know, oftentimes when you go to uh, night, uh, nightclubs or uh, uh, restaurants, you know, they'll have asked to serve you a cocktail and cocktails almost always have bitters in there of some sort. And part of the reason is because they know it promotes digestion, but it also maybe improves or increases your appetite so you'll eat more. The root has been used uh, for liver diseases such as jaundice and cirrhosis, along with dyspepsia and gallbladder problems. It's high in potassium, calcium, sodium, and salicylic acid. That's, that's part of the nutritive benefit of, of herbs in general. They're high in vitamins. Uh, the, the uh, yellow flower of the uh, dandelion is loaded with, uh, with the uh, antioxidant lutein. Many people are buying and spending a lot of money on lutein these days, They're buying it for their eye health. And that yellow color is in, in dandelions is lutein. In fact, uh, that's the one nice thing about color. You know, they say get more color in your diet. And that's because almost invariably the same chemicals they give the plant its color are what uh, uh, give the plant its antioxidant uh, activity. So getting more color in your diet is very, is very good. So leaves can be harvested just before flowering and later in summer and using salads and can replace spinach and recipes like in the lasagna that I showed you. It's re it makes really good pesto. Another good way to take uh, dandelions is, is ro the roasted root. If you take the if you roast the roots, if you take the roots, chop them up, and roast them for about an hour and a half to two hours at 170 degrees in your oven, they'll turn a nice dark brown. And then you 
uh, you put them in water uh, and you boil them for about two to three hours and it gets this really rich, uh, deep, nice, sweet, sweet uh, with flavor with a little bit of bitterness. As you, as you boil these roots, the, the natural uh, sweetness comes out and it's not so bitter. And then I like to uh, have it with a little bit of honey. It's a very good, it would be a very good uh, morning drink uh, for replacing coffee, for example, it doesn't have any caffeine in it, of course, but it's it's good for your. It would be good for your liver and for your digestion. And you can also make a, a tea out of the leaf, and also make a tincture. And we'll talk about each of these types of uh, ways to take herbs. Another one, another way to take herbs is, 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 and the most common way around the world is as a hot infusion or what we call a tea. Uh, you, around the world, most people call tea, when they talk about tea, they're talking about chamomile sinensis or green tea. Uh, but here we call all herbs, all herbal teas, or herbal infusions, I should say, so the me too, teas. By the way, that's a cup that my wife makes. She's a, my wife is a potter up here in Ellison Bay and she makes beautiful cups. One good thing about uh, make when you're making your own fresh teas, it's also always good to either make them in a pot that's covered, or if you're going to make them in your cup, have a cover on your cup because that helps to prevent the loss of volatile oils and other things that are uh, positive have positive effects. That you. Dave, what's, what's her shop called? Lynn's Pottery. Lynn's Pottery. Lynn's yep. Pottery. Awesome. Does she have these for sale at the shop? Yep. Yep. These cups are the cups are for sale at the shop. So hot infusions draw out vitamins, enzymes, and aromatic volatile oils. A few good herbs for hot infusions include red clover, valerian, nettle, mint, and skullcap. Usually the leaves, we're usually talking about leaves and the flowers when you're making hot infusions like this way. The basic method is to scoop one to three teaspoons of dried herb into a cup, pour a cup of boiled water over a top, and then cover it, and then steep it for about 15 minutes to up to an hour and strain. Uh, you know, the longer you can steep it, the more of these nutrients are gonna come out in the water. Do you recommend to dry it first and then brew it? Uh, or you can, can you do use... it either way. You can either do okay. it with dried herbs or, or, uh, or fresh. Uh, th there are some exceptions to that rule that you could do either way. Uh, like mints usually are extract better uh, when they're dried first. So okay. otherwise using the fresh herb is, is fine. You can just go pick it up, go pick it in. Or if you wanna like with roots, uh, like a lot of roots, uh, which we'll be talking about in a minute with decoctions, they, they, because of their bitterness that they have, if you roast roots uh, uh, for a while, that helps to bring out some of the, uh, the natural sweetness of the root, and so it won't be quite so bitter. So that'll, that'll add a little, make it a little bit more palatable, because some, some herbs can be, you know, can have pretty strong flavors. Then there's a cold infusions are ideal for slimy herbs and herbs with the delicate essential oils. And that would be things like marshmallow roots, slippery elm, cleavers, fresh lemon balm. And the basic method is just, just to place the herbs in a jar, pitcher, fill with cold water and cover, and then allow to infuse overnight. And then you can keep in the refrigerator. Usually you would strain the herbs out if you want to, uh, and then um, drink it. So the other way, uh, another way is to make them as, as a decoction. And a decoction is, for, those are for herbs that have are hard, you know, that are, have more dense materials like hard the roots and the dried berries and barks and seeds because they're denser and just pouring boiling water over them and letting them steep for a while won't allow that ex the extraction to take place. So a few good herbs would be like dandelion root, echinacea root, wild cherry bark, white oak bark, pine needles. And the basic method is to just place three to four tablespoons of the dried herb in a small saucepan, cover the herbs with a quart of cold water, slowly heat the water to a simmer and cover, and then allow it to gently simmer for anywhere from two to four hours. I think the longer you do it, the better it is, and the more, the more flavorful the herb, will, uh, the, the herb final product will be. Then you strain and you can reserve the tea in a quart jar and you can refrigerate it and rewarm it if you want to. So, and then, also another way to take to use herbs is as baths. Um, you can take a foot bath or a sits bath or, or a tub bath. Now there's even, there are herbalists, uh, especially in France, where they recommend that people use the foot bath as a way to take all herbs. You know, one of the problems with that people have, a lot of people have with herbs is that 
they tend to be, they don't taste very good. A lot of them don't taste very good, especially some of the ones that have stronger therapeutic action. And so actually if by making the tea and, 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 and uh, uh, soaking your feet in it or, so, or soaking in a bath, you actually will absorb the herb through the skin. And so you, don't, you can avoid having to have the taste problem. And the other thing about it is if you make it, um, once you make a, a, the strong tea, uh, and then you use it as a foot bath or whatever, especially if it's a foot bath, you can reuse it. You don't have to throw it out every time. You can reuse it for a couple days without having to uh, um, uh, re re redo it and everything. So that, that's one of the nice things about using as a, in a foot bath. Where if you use it in a bathtub, of course, you're gonna drain it out and you won't have it again for use. But, but uh, the other thing about uh, baths is that you get the aromatherapy part of it because a lot of herbs, have a strong aroma, and you know there there is an action that that can be had from the herb by just smelling it, because smelling it, you know, can be a relaxing type of thing. Uh, and I mentioned the absorption of herbs through the skin. So uh, another way to take herbs, and and the one that's uh, used by uh, most herbalists in this country, uh, is tinctures. And tinctures are water alcohol extractions of herbs. Vodka is a popular choice, and some people use vinegar to avoid alcohol. So the advantages of a tincture is that they have a long shelf life. They can last years. I had an herbalist once who was talking about an herbal preparation, herbal tincture that he found that was labeled, and it was 60, 60, 60 years old, and he found it to still be effective. So alcohol is a good preservative, basically, is what that means. And also you get good absorption of nutrients because they're already in a liquid form. Yeah, easy dosage adjustment with, with a tincture, you can give as little as three or four drops to as many as 20 drops for a tablespoon, tablespoonful if, if required. Uh, and so, you know, you can adjust the dosage for children or for senior citizens, or if some herbs are stronger than others. So you don't have to take, you know, you don't have to take a specific amount that you would get like a tablet or capsule. So fat, and also uh, tinctures have faster action for herbs used for acute situations. You know, if you have uh, muscle cramping, there are herbs that can help with muscle cramping, especially uh, women who have uh, uterine cramping during menstruation, uh, black cohosh tincture can relieve that, that contraction, that, those muscle contractions within just a few minutes. You don't wanna wait for a long time for that to happen. Another good, uh, uh, way for, another good thing about tinctures is the bit where I mentioned the bitters and like a, if you have a bitter tonic which is usually a tincture alcohol extract um, if you have like gassy or bloated feeling after you've eaten something if you take just a small amount maybe t 10 or 15 drops of a, of, a, of a bitters tincture you can relieve that gas and bloating within 15 to 20 minutes it works quite fast so to make a tincture, it's pretty simple. You just chop large leaves, flowers, or roots, leave delicate leaves and flowers whole, then fill the glass jar loosely with the plant material and add enough alcohol to cover the plant materials. Then you seal the jar tightly. Label and date the jar to include the plant parts tinctured and the type of alcohol used, and set aside in a cool, dark place, shaking or stirring daily and adding more alcohol if needed to keep the plant materials covered. So how long would you do it? Well, it depends on the type of, you know, the part of the plant that you're using. For leaves and flowers, you only need to let it sit for about two to three weeks because they're a lot easier to extract from. For roots and barks, they're, they're de again, they're denser material. It could take longer for the extraction process to work. So you would let it sit for about six weeks. And while you're doing this, you should always shake the bottle up daily. And then after you're done with the, uh, making the herbal tinctures, some people recommend putting it into like uh, brown or, or dark colored jars. You can do that, but it, it's just as well just to put it in a cupboard somewhere so it's out of the direct sunlight because sunlight can uh, cause the deterioration uh, over, over a period of time uh, of the herbal product. And then another good way to, to use uh, herbs is topically as oils or ointments. For, uh, those are specifically applied topically for local areas for specific actions, including like as an anti-inflammatory, an antimicrobial, an antipyritic, which is for itching, an astringent, and a
Stupefaction is the effect where you apply something and it causes blood, uh, your causes the area to redden. That means that there's that there's more uh, uh, blood coming to the area, and that can be good for helping to relax muscles and ease pain. And the vulnerable area is for for wound healing. This is a really a good one to use topically. And these flowers, these are usually flowering sometime in, in the uh, beginning to mid, mid to late June. Um, and in fact, it's called St. John's boy because typically it was thought that it was, they started to bloom on June 24th, which is St. John's, uh, uh, his saint's day in the Catholic Church. So to make the oil, cover the flowers with a good cold pressed olive oil and leave the seal preparation in the sun for 21 days or until it becomes a rich red. So here's the, this is the last year I did this. There's a bottle that I said, this was the first day. And you can see the yellow flowers. Basically what you need to do is just cut off the, the top yellow flowers with some of their leaves. Uh, you know, the flowering tops basically is what you want to put in the jar. And you let it sit in the sun during the day and then at, at night you bring it in and then you put it back out in the sun in the next day. And after about three weeks, this is what it looks like. You get this really rich, deep, rich red oil. There's a red, there's a red oil that is in the plant and the flower, the flowers. If you're if you're out and you're picking St. John's Wort flowers and you take a flower and you rub it in the palm of your hand, you'll you'll see this red stain there, a lot, red stain which is which disappears, you know, washes away. But it, it's really interesting transformation of this plant. So you apply it topically, it will speed the healing of wounds and bruises, varicose veins and mild burns. And the oil is especially useful for the healing of sunburn. So this is really a good topical first aid oil for all sorts of problems. Another thing that it's good for is uh, uh, nerve pain too. St. John's wort is really good for nerve pain. Uh, I've used it for, um, if you ever have a sciatic problem with your sciatic nerve in your back and you're going down your leg, just apply that to, to that and you know, after you apply it a couple times, the, the pain will usually go away. It's, it's really quite effective. I, I, I have some around all the time. So let's look at some of the herbs now, some of the other herbs. So one of the spring herbs is burdock, Arctium lapa. And the, the part that's usually used is the root. And the roots are really deep. One of the things, if you are going to dig up this root, you can see that root there. It's about approximately 18 to 24 inches long. Some of them go even deeper than that. So if you want to uproot it, you got to really dig deep. So it's a valuable remedy for the treatment of skin conditions, which result in dry and scaly skin. Part of the action of the herb is through the bitter stimulation of the digestive fluids and especially your bile secretion. Thus it will aid digestion and appetite. So this is one of those bitter herbs. Sternal Externally, it may be used as a compress or poultice to speed up the healing of wounds and ulcers. The, the, sometime, if, you, if you are into Japanese food uh, and you go to a sushi bar, sometimes they'll, they'll serve a vegetable they call gobo, which is basically the uh, inner stalk of the burdock tree, of the burdock plant. So the, it is edible. Uh, you can, if you take the lower parts of the stalk and you peel off the outer uh, skin uh, and then boil it. It's, it's can be used as a vegetable. You can also use the fresher parts of the roots as a vegetable. Um, they are kind of bitter, so cooking them for a little while helps a lot. And then sometimes it's good to make them with vinegar because that kind of that kind of uh, counteracts the bitterness a little bit. These are also herbs again are very high in minerals. This one is high in chromium, iron, magnesium, silicon, and thiamine, but be one of the B vitamins. So you can make a decoction or a tincture out of this. Uh, again, the, the, this would be a good treatment for uh, one of the conditions would be good for would be acne for kids who have acne problems. In fact, uh, you know we talked about uh, taking herbs topically, uh, and this is a good one to use topically topically, since it doesn't taste so good, you can make uh, for kids uh, or anybody who has acne problems, if you make a good, get a good clay and you make the clay and you use the, for, as the water to make in the clay, you use a, a tincture uh, partly of the burdock root and that'll give that astringency to it. 
uh, and that'll also help to treat uh, the acne and to help it clear up faster. And then you apply the mask and you should leave it on for, if you put a mask on for acne, you should leave it on for at least an hour to an hour to two hours. I remember my daughter used to do it and she would uh, put, leave it on overnight. She'd put it on at night before she went to bed, leave it on right and wash it off the next day. Really can make a big difference for that particular condition or, or, ex, or any kind of eczema or psoriasis as well. Uh, the ramps are starting to come up um, and uh, the, the uh, also known as wild leeks. And uh, the first thing that comes up with the leaves and eventually you see the flowers and then that you can harvest the, the ball. You're, most people recommend harvesting just the leaves and they do have a very strong flavor and you can use them in your food. Um, we're, we're fortunate here in Door County in that we have a, an extreme abundance of leeks. I mean, uh, there's one uh, 40 acre plot that I go to, wooded plot that I go to harvest mine. There's literally tens of thousands of leeks growing on it. I mean, and every, you can see them growing all, you know, when I'm driving down the highway, uh, uh, down uh, Old Stage Road, I mean, you can look in, under, in the wooded areas, uh, and you can just see that they're the, some of the first plants that come up in the spring. So it's a spring tonic in Native American medicine and used to treat cold, sore throat, and worms in children. Traditionally, the leaves were used in the treatment of colds and croup. The warm oil extract of the leaves and bulbs is used externally in the treatment of earaches. So if you make this as an oil extract, and basically when you apply uh, oil in the ear, that's an external use. So it's an oil you're applying externally. And if you have, if you're going to use the uh, the the ramps, uh, you uh, you know if you have the leaves and or the bulbs, you have to cover them oil. You should let them sit for a day or two before you use them to get a good uh, extraction into the oil. So it's a pungent herb with properties similar to garlic. So one of the things that garlic is, is there is some anti-inflammatory compounds in it, so it's good for inflammation. Um, bulbs were traditionally baked in the fire or dried for use as a food to reduce acidity. They were used mainly as flavoring in salads and savory dishes. A mild, has a mild sweet flavor resembling leeks. I like to make a, a, I like make a leek potato soup out of it, which is really quite delicious. And one of the things that I do is I take the bulbs and I chop them up and dry them and then I store them and I use them throughout the winter. I can add them to soups and stews and stuff for a nice flavor. Lady slipper is an herb that is, uh, has been traditionally been used medicinally, but now is considered an endangered species. We're fortunate here in, in Door County that we have quite a, quite a good growth of especially the yellow lady slipper. But uh, this is one that you should not harvest, but I just thought I'd bring it up because it is a spring flower. It was used to, uh, to specific remedy to overcome depression, mental anxiety, and troubled sleep. It was often recommended for, for women for both emotional and physical imbalances relating to menopause or menstruation, such as nervous tension, headaches, or cramps. Large doses may cause headaches and also disorientation, so you, can, you only need small amounts of it. What's usually used is the um, alcoholic extract because I mean, you can make a large amount of alcohol extract with just a, a small little root. Um, but again, I mean, if you have some growing on your property, and you and you and you harvest them sustainably, but you know, but it uses. It is one of the most beautiful uh, spring plants, and one that um, has been used in the past medicinally. So, uh, garlic mustard is one that's an invasive plant. Uh, actually was brought here by the English uh, settlers and because they grew it as a pot herb and they grew it in their gardens and it escaped from the gardens. So the young leaves add a mild garlic flavor to salads and pestos. The pest is really, this is a really good herb to use for pestos and in salads. Uh, the leaves have a very definite smell and taste of garlic. If you've ever tried to you know, get rid of your, your uh, garlic mustard, you know that it has a very strong uh, fragrance. They are slightly bitter with a Swedish aftertaste and make an excellent addition to salads. It also gives a delicate flavor to such bland foods as eggs and sauces. With cooking, they lose their aroma while retaining most of their bitterness and are bitter raw. 
So during the, the leads, we're, we're applying essays to open storage. And the for edema and to induce sweating. Sweat, you know, sweating is a good thing uh, to if you if you have someone who is uh, has uh, pale, dry skin. Sweating can help to cool or, or, or excessive heat, like like a um, uh, heat rash. Sweating is a good thing because sweating uh, the body the 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 to release this fluids and then they as they evaporate they cool you. And also, stomach it helps digestion. Another good herb for the digestion. So this would be a good, really good one to add to like your spring salads. Blood root of the uh, spring, and they call it blood root because if you take a harvest the root and cut open, it bleeds. It literally looks like it's bleeding red blood, as you can see from that picture. So it has been used historically in numerous topical preparations for the treatment of various skin cancers and also for sores, warts, eczema, and other epidermal and uh, uh, epidermal problems. It also has been used internally in herbal preparations for congestion of lung conditions such as emphysema and chronic bronchitis. It is considered to be toxic somewhat, uh, not that it's gonna kill you. Uh, for a while there, there was actually a company uh, that was making a toothpaste and mouthwash that had an extract called Sanguinaria. <laughs> Uh, in it, which has come from the, uh, or sangu sanguine, which is the, comes from the sanguine area, uh, which is uh, found in blood root, which kills bacteria and stops them from converting carbohydrates into gum tissue eating acid and blocks enzymes that destroy collagen and gum tissue. So this, is, well, this would be a good mouthwash for someone who has uh, uh, gum problems. Uh, and you would just make a wa wash out of it, uh, uh, like with water, um, and um, then you would uh, spit it out afterwards so you wouldn't have to worry, you know, there would be no toxic effects from using it occasionally. So usually you make a fresh extract with uh, fresh root with alcohol or vinegar. I used, it, I used it topically to get rid of small little growths on my skin, uh, like warts and stuff like that. You can actually make a strong extract or alcohol extract with it and then just put a few drops and let it dry on the, on the ward or on the skin growth. And after over a period of several weeks, you can actually see it disappear. We see growing early in the spring. And Looks like this is a Screen might be frozen. The treatment of bronchitis may be used. I'm just going to have Dave pause for a minute. Irritations, wounds. Oh no. Hold on. Dave, can you hear us? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, it looks like your screen share went away. Yeah, it did. All right. I got it back. I thought we're testing. We're testing the limits of our techiness here. Well, it says my connection is unstable right now. That's what it's telling me. Okay. Well, we'll just keep going, and then if it freezes again, then we'll just kill the okay. slideshow, and you can take questions. How about? Yeah. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. Oh, see now I got now I'm stuck now I'm stalled again. Well, why don't we just um. You want to just Does anybody questions? have questions at this point? Well, I have a question actually. So right. um, the so the ramps they look a lot like um, a, the the deadly. Well, I don't know what the deadly. What's what are they? There's a there's a 
evil twin that they have. Oh, I'm not sure what that is. There's a, like, isn't there something that, like, is kind of deadly? It's like a white flower. The, the ramps? Yeah. Well, I, the, the one thing, nice thing about ramps Lily, is it has Lily the, of the Valley. That's oh, what Lily it is. Of Lily of the Valley. That's the thing you yeah. got to watch out for with that yeah. one. Yeah. Well, Lily of the Valley itself isn't deadly. Actually, the, the, the worst part of the, of the Lily of the Valley is the, is the root. So the leaves themselves aren't, aren't so bad. Um, oh, well, wait, we it looks like we're going again. I got, we got it going again there. So the, uh, the ramps, the, the nice thing about the ramps is they have such a distinctive odor. I mean, you can just walk through them and you'll smell them. And the Lily of the Valley doesn't have that, that, that fragrance. The, the leaves, the, what, what, the Lily of the Valley has a, uh, a, digi a, a, a digitalist like glyc glycoside in it, which can have an effect on the heart. And uh, that usually isn't a problem unless you're, uh, unless you're, um, take a, a really large dose of it. Okay. So okay. They, they say for kids, you know, that they shouldn't be eating them. Uh, it's going to make, it may make you sick. You, you're more likely to throw up than anything uh, if you take any amount of them. And so it's usually not such a problem. So again. Do you mind, would you start over the slide, the violet slide? Because I think we might have missed this part of it in the internet. Okay, I can, but I, I'm stalled again too. Well, shoot. The internet, I tell you. Well, I think I, I'm a, this may be my computer, unfortunately. I think I've been having some problems. Oh, wait, there we go. Oh. So let's go, we can go back. Wait a minute. No, we can go, go from here, Dave. That's okay. Okay. So common, the plantain is the next one that comes up pretty, uh, pretty early. Uh, it helps to quickly staunch his blood flow, encourages the repair of damaged tissue, apply it, usually use it topically. There's two kinds of uh, plantain, the plantago major, which is the one in the upper left-hand corner, and then the plantago lanceolata, which is the one in the lower corner. They both are, are, are members of the same family. They both have the same properties, but they do look a little different. You chew the leaves. Uh, this is really a good one for insect bites or mosquito bites. You actually, if you have a bite, if you chew the leaves, uh, and they are somewhat bitter tasting, and then apply it as a poultice to the wherever you have the bite, it can actually stop the swelling. And the sooner you can put it on, the better. So it's good for snake bites. Uh, this is one of the snake roots that the uh, the Native Americans had a lot of plants that they called snake roots because they were good for snake bites. And this is one of them. So a plantain ointment is good for treatment of cuts and bruises, for uh, eczema, psoriasis, hemorrhoids. It acts as a gentle expectorant while also soothing inflamed and sore membranes, making it ideal for coughs and mild bronchitis. So this would be a good tea to brew if you had a problem with, with uh, bronchitis. The seeds are, are closely related to psyllium seeds uh, and can be used similarly. A tablespoon or two soaked in hot sweetened water or fruit juice until a mucilage is formed and the whole gruel drunk is a lubricating laxative. Um, in fact, planta plantain, uh, one of the uh, species of plantago is plantago psyllium and that's where they have much bigger seeds. The plantago lanceolata, which is the one that's in the bottom right hand corner, has, you can see the little brown seeds on there. So this has a lot more seeds. So th those would be the best ones to harvest uh, other than the last, uh, the major one, which is in the top left-hand corner because that one, the seeds are much more, there's like a little tail, I call it a rat tail. It sticks up out of the center of the plant that has the seeds on it. And they're not as easy to access, to, to use. So a juice on a piece of cotton applied to a tooth cavity can relieve cause cases of toothache as well. So it's a, a very, it can be a very useful plant. And this is one that grows in a lot of disturbed areas, uh, you know, where its soil has been disturbed, like after snow plowing, uh, you know, during the winter. Growing alongside your driveway or areas where there's trample downs take over. This is bearberry, which is also the one known as uva ursi, the one that I mentioned early on is used in kinnik kinnik as a, it means bear's grape in Latin and uva for grape and ursus for bear. 
Arctostophilus is from the Greek for arctos, meaning bear, and stophil, a bunch of grapes. Bears are fond of the fruit, so that's why they call it bearberry. Native American people used it as a urinary remedy and also enjoyed smoking a blend of ursi leaves and tobacco, which was the smoking mixture, tinnic tinnic. Is one of the more best natural urinary antiseptics. It has been used extensively in herbal medicine to disinfect and astringe the urinary tract in cases of acute and chronic cystitis and urethritis. So, with, with this one, you would make a, a decoction and you would put a, tea, a cup of boiling water, a one teaspoon in a cup of water, and let it boil to a half hour or so. Uh, and then you can drink up to three cups a day or you can make a tincture out of it. It's the diuretic most often used in herbal weight loss formulas as a diuretic. So if, if you see, uh, you might see it listed as uva ursi, or you might see it uh, listed as arctostaphylus, but it is often in weight loss formulas. And it is among the herbs useful in diabetes for excessive sugar. So if, if someone has a diabetic problem, this would be a good tea to drink on a, you know, maybe once a day, have a cup of this tea to help restore blood sugar balance. This one, uh, bearberry is one actually, I was up on um, Europe Bay Road and there alongside the road, there's a whole big, a large, huge, large patch of it growing right now with the berries. It, it's, it survives the winter under the snow and it's, so it's still green in the, in the spring. Herb Robert is a real, is a real common, in, it's considered an invasive plant, it's a geranium. It's a geranium family member. It's employed in much the same way as American cranes bill, which is so it's effective against stomach ulcers and inflammation of the uterus. So you, um, the fresh roots taste like parsnips, and they are a delicacy when cooked or baked in bechamel sauce. So if you want to use the herb, uh, you use two teaspoons of the dried herb per cup of cold water, letting the mixture steep overnight. You never boil this herb, you just let it, this is a cold infusion you want to make out of this one. And then a daily dosage of it is of two cups. Some people use, uh, make a wine out of this for chronic gastric inflammation. They fill a jar half and half with freshly plucked chopped herb Robert and a good red wine. And let the mixture stand for two weeks before straining it into a cork bottle. And you take two to three sips before meals. This has a little bit of in, a, a, a bitterness to it and it's anti-inflammatory because of its astringency. So it's really good for a, pro, a person who has chronic stomach problems. Uh, a good herb, a good pot herb that comes up early in the spring and it's the best time to harvest it is the nettle, is the best time to harvest it in the spring. The nettle leaves are a blood builder, often used as a spring tonic and to treat anemia and poor circulation. And by a blood builder, it means it has a lot of nutrients that help you to, to you know, especially the liver function uh, and the all, all those and those areas that, where you're actually making red blood cells. So it helps to, gives you those nutrients that you need for that. Nettle seed can be used as a kidney trophy restorative, literally a food for the kidneys. So if you have a kidney problem, nettle seed which you obviously have to harvest later in the summer, is a good uh, treatment for chronic kidney problems. Nettle is used by asthmatics. You mix the juice of the leaves or roots with honey and take to relieve bronchial or asthmatic troubles. When you say the juice, basically you make a strong tea out of it and mix it with honey. Both a tea and a poultice of cooked nettles are used to treat eczema and other skin conditions, skin conditions topically. So you just apply it to the eczema. And the other, another, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is full of nutrients. It's got lots of calcium, magnesium, potassium, up to nine grams of protein in a, in a 30 gram, which is one ounces of the herbs, and up to 11.9 grams of carbohydrates. So it's very highly nutritive, it's a good food. This would be a good herb to use early, pick the early leaves in the spring and add to salads, or to soups. Uh, you can also make an infusion out of these or a tincture and use the, and, and to preserve. The one, like I said, the one thing nice thing about tincture is if you want to use something on, a re, on an ongoing basis, it preserves the herb and the, herbal ex, and the herbal extract. You get a complete extract of the herb 
and uh, it doesn't deteriorate over time. Pineapple weed is, is a nice one. Uh, this one is the one that grows along in disturbed areas. It's found in hard packed ground and op along open fields and roadsides or in parking lots. Uh, a lot, like I, I've seen it growing it, it, along the roads here in uh, Garrett Bay Road and it just really starts early in spring. And it's actually related to uh, chamomile. So it makes a soothing, rela a relaxing, soothing tea. An infusion will allay symptoms of influenza and digestive disorders. So it helps, it helps to calm your stomach. Uh, that's, that's the symptom. It's not, it's not an anti-influenza thing. What it does is it settles your stomach. It's also anti-alimentic. Anti that means it helps to restore, um, helps to get rid of worms. Externally, it can be used as a mouth rinse for mouth sores and topically in treatments for skin disorders. So a strong mouth, a mouthwash, this is really good for a person who had like canker sores or mouth sores, you can use it as a mouthwash. You make a strong tea, strong infusion out of it. This is one that would be good to make uh, like a, a cold infusion where you would make it, put the water over the, over the herb and let it sit overnight to make a strong uh, cold infusion. The flower heads can be eaten raw or cooked. Add them to salads, vegetable, casseroles, and, and stir fries. Uh, for the infusion, use two to three teaspoonfuls uh, in water for 10 minutes, three to four times a day. If you want to make a, a tea, that, that's good for a relaxing tea. Tincture, one to four meals, three times a day. And for a bath, you could use it in a bath. You take four teaspoons of the dried herb, 500 mils of water, and strain into a bath. And again, this would be, if you want to use it for a bath, it'd probably be a good idea to make a cold infusion out of this uh, and then use that the next day for your bath. Red clover is another early uh, spring flower. Uh, and it may be used with complete safety in case of childhood eczema. It may also be of value in other chronic skin conditions such as psoriasis. So you can use it orally or you can use it topically uh, and you can make a strong infusion out of this. The expectorant and antispasmodic action give this remedy a role in the treatment of coughs and bronchitis, but especially in whooping cough. Back around the turn of the, uh, the in the early 20th century, whooping cough was a really a bad problem in around the country, and uh, there really wasn't any treatment for it. They didn't have the vaccine for it at the time, and so uh, a lot of people would die from it because they had the spasmodic coughing. But eclectic physicians who were doctors that use a lot of herbs, they would use a strong, uh, either a syrup of red clover or a tea, and it would help stop the, that spasmodic coughing. It's also used uh, as part of a holistic treatment for breast tumors and fibroids. Uh, in fact, there are some estrogenic type compounds in it, and it's believed that they, one of the, the actions of those estrogen compounds is that they block estrogen receptors. A lot, a lot of women who have breast cancer have uh, cancers that are, 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 are sensitive to estrogen levels in the body. So to, to the extent that they can block those estrogen receptors, they can block the effect of estrogen on the breasts. It's also a mineral tonic and nutritive, a very high, another one of those plants is very high in nutrients. Uh, you can use an infusion or a tincture. The um, Native Americans would, uh, would use a clover in several ways. They would use the foliage, was eaten fresh before the plant flowered, or it was cooked by placing moistened layers of plants one upon another in a stone oven. So you can use it as a, as a pot, or as, a, as a herb, you could use it and make, put it into salads or soups and stews. Uh, one way to get it into your diet. Motherwort uh, is another herb that can be very useful. It grows wild around Door County. I know I have some growing all around my property. It's valuable in the stimulation of delayed or suppressed menstruation, especially where there is anxiety or tension involved. It's a really calming herb. It's, a, it's also a useful tonic for aging and menopausal changes. And it may be used to ease false labor pains. And it's an excellent tonic for the heart, strengthening without straining. It is considered to be a specific in cases of tachycardia or heart palpitations. So if you have a problem with heart palpitations, this would be a good herb to take. I, I've made uh, uh, tinctures out of this for myself. And I use it, I have a heart, you know, an ongoing heart issue. And uh, 
often I'll use Hawthorne for it, which is really a good one too. Um, but if I don't have Hawthorne, I, I will use ha uh, the motherwort. And interesting, the, the, uh, the Latin name Leonaris cardiaca means lion-hearted. So you can make an infusion of the, of the leaves and the flowering tops. Uh, you know, usually you, want, you don't want to start using it until the, it starts to flower. And if you make a tincture, you use the, again, just use the top three or four or five inches of the plant when you're making a tincture. You can use the whole thing, the leaves and the flowers, and you can tincture it, make a tincture out of that. And then you take that one to four milliliters. Four milliliters is approximately a teaspoonful, three, up to three times a day. When I take it, I usually, uh, if I make the tincture, I usually take a tablespoon once a day just to make it a little easier to, so I don't forget to take it. False Solomon seal is another early spring uh, plant. Um, and uh, the root is effective to balsam and expectorant and good in the inflammatory stages of infections and for sore throats. It's used for treating rheumatism and kidney problems. It has been used to treat congestive heart failure. There's actually a compound in it called convalerin, which strengthens the contractions of the heart, slows the pulse, normalizes blood pressure, stimulates respiration, and increases the appetite and rate of digestion. So it's really uh, a nice, the way I prepare it uh, for that, I, I, the tincture, I make a tincture out of it. I use it myself. I also think it's a good, lubricating tonic for the joints. It's because it has, it does have an demulcent, which is a soothing effect. It also has some anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So I, I used it for many years uh, uh, for my knee. I had a bad knee until I had a, repla a knee replacement about three years ago. And I would make a tincture uh, in brandy and the root has a natural sweetness to it. It's, you know, if you take the fresh root and chew on it, You'll taste, first you'll taste sweetness, but then it gets a little bit bitter. But if you make a, a tincture, the brandy extract of it, it's really quite delicious and easy to eat and easy to take. And so I, I would take that, I would take about a tablespoon of that as a tonic for my arthritic, for my, uh, for my knee joint. And it would really seem to work well as, uh, you know, it's not gonna restore your joint to health, but it's gonna help to keep down the inflammation, which leads to, which is what causes the pain. Now, there's a couple of herbs um, that, uh, of course, the pines are, are one that we see all year round. And this is a nice one, you know, flowers in the spring. But this is a good one to have around, because, know about, because a tea made from the young needles is used for, to treat sore throat. is a good source of vitamin C, and so it's effective against scurvy. But it's one of the reasons that's taken. I mean, scurvy causes gum problems, which is you know, so, and which is another reason why it's good for sore throats because that's, that's similar tissues. Um, but it's, it's also has some expectorant action and um, which makes it good for the lungs. And so this is a good expectorant, this is a good herb. This is one of those herbs that you have to brew, you know, uh, as a decoction. And I usually just use, instead of the inner bark, I usually just get the pine needles and I put them in water, I boil them for about two to three hours. So it's just a mild boil, a light boil. And, and the, the liquid, interestingly enough, turns this beautiful red color. And then I add a little honey to it and I make a nice syrup out of it. Sometimes I'll, I'll do that with wild cherry bark. I'll take the uh, bark of, of, of the bra some branches of a wild cherry and I'll boil it together with the white pine and get the wild cherry. I mean, years ago, wild cherry was a common uh, expectorant herb that was used for congestion in the lungs. And so th this, this, a tea like this would probably be beneficial for people who are starting to feel congestion in their lungs and, and may be beneficial for someone who was uh, suffering from the COVID virus who started to get that lung congestion, which is the big problem with the, uh, with the COVID virus. And the resin of the pine trees is antiseptic. So you know, if you're, a, this is a good, uh, this is like nature's bandage. If you're out, if you have a cut and you, you get some of that sap, the resin that comes out of the pine trees when the branch is broken and you put, apply that, that'll help to hold the wound closed and also has antiseptic a action. So it acts like a, a natural, a nature's bandage, if you will. 
and I thought I mentioned elderberry, even though it's not the flower, it does flower in spring, but the berries are what's usually used. And th this has gotten a lot of uh, play on the internet recently because of the COVID virus. So elderberries, both flowers and fruits have been shown to decrease the chances of contracting the flu, which is not what COVID is. Remember, it's, it's similar to the flu, but it's not. So there is actually no research to show that, that this is gonna be, do the same thing for flu. But a lot of people are using this. And it uh, is, so it, it, it decreased the chances of contracting the flu and it may shorten its durations if you happen to get it. So in, with flu, it's been shown in double blind placebo controlled studies to, to reduce the symptoms to three to four days. And usually a flu, well, it usually runs course in about seven to 10 days. So one of the things that's been shown to do in one study is that it increase, increases cytokine production, which strengthens cell membranes to prevent virus penetration. So I would, I would not say that you know, this is not what I would use as a treatment for, for flu, for flu maybe, but not for COVID virus, but it may be useful if you're concerned about catching the virus to be taking elderberry syrup. Uh, and you can make your own syrup if, you're, if you can get the, the elderberries. Now, the one thing, there has been some information about toxicity of elderberries. There is two varieties of elderberries. There's the Sambucus nigra, and then there's a Sambucus Europa, I think it's called. There, it's a red, has a red berry. The, the elderberry that we, you want is the one that has a dark purple to black berry when it's ripe. And it, it does start out red, but it turns red, this dark purple, as you can see in that picture. And that's the one that's, that's, that's perfectly safe to use. There was actually, uh, there was a product that's been on the market for some years that was uh, made in Israel called Sambucol which is a, a, a elderberry syrup, which is quite expensive. But you can make your own by filling a quart jar with berries, cover with apple cider vinegar, or let's sit for three to four days. Then you strain it through cheesecloth and add an equal amount of honey and gently heat to dissolve the honey. Store it in a refrigerator for up to three months. And then you take one tablespoon twice daily. So if you were gonna use it, you should, it's best used as a preventative, as a tonic. You know, a lot of people would uh, make, this was, in areas where it grows, it was not unusual for people to make this syrup and use it as a tonic, like one tablespoon a day throughout the uh, winter to help prevent colds and flus. So if, if you're interested in more information about herbs, uh, I have a YouTube channel called Herb TV. And on it, I have about 140 uh, different uh, little short videos that range anywhere from five to seven minutes to up to half hour long about herbs and how to use them. And so that's the website there, YouTube. Uh, and, and if you just go to YouTube and, and, and search for Herb TV, you can find it. And that's what I got for you. So herbal peace, a little bit of herbal peace is what I have for you. So, so I'd Morgan, be happy if there's any questions to answer anybody's questions. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone. Morgan, there was a question that came over on Facebook. Correct. It was, what do you know about the benefits of pomegranate juice? Well, um, you know, juices in general have very similar action. And most of the time when you, you know, different juices have had varying amounts of scientific studies done on them for one reason or another, pomegranate juice you know, it's been real popular. So there has been people have done studies and most of the benefits of these juices from what I've seen are from the high antioxidant content. And the thing about any ju any fruit juice, pomegranates or, or elderberries or wild, you know, or cherries or uh, any kind of wild fruits that you could pick raspberries they all have, they're all very, very high in antioxidants. And so I don't think that, I don't think that one juice is any more beneficial than another. Uh, and so much of what I see is basically used for promotional benefit, you know, promotional effect, because they want to promote the use of their juices. So I think juices in general have very, uh, are very good to get, uh, and, you know, you're, you're I think juices, of plants 
just have so many benefits because of the antioxidants. And that's basically what I think what gives pomegranate its benefits. And so I don't think it's any better than any other juice though, in terms of its benefits. One of the other thing about, anti -inflammatory, about uh, antioxidants is that they do have anti-inflammatory action. So oftentimes they'll talk about juices and their anti-inflammatory benefits, but that's because of the high antioxidant content. Um, while we're kind of like on the, the, the berries and um, Barb had hoped that maybe you could repeat some information about the bear berry because that's where it kind of got um, cut off. Okay, so, the bear berry? Yeah, well, don't feel like you need to go back in the slideshow. I, right, you, so yeah. it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's, good for, it's good for urinary tract problems. So if you have a chronic urinary tract problem, you know, oftentimes they'll talk about you hear about cranberry juice. There's another one of those juices that we're, you know, we're talking about, cranberry juice for urinary tract infections. Well, if you take cranberry juice and you mix it with bearberry or, or, or kinnikinnik tincture, you're gonna get a much more beneficial effect. It has antiseptive activity yeah, in, the urinary, uh, in the urinary tract. And it's also has some, uh, it also has some anti-inflammatory. So, so it helps to reduce the irritation in the infect, of the infection. You know, the thing is about herbs in general, they're, they're not so much that they have a, ha, kill bacteria, so much as what they do is they promote the body's natural ability to get, to remove bacteria from the system. I mean, the, that's what our immune system does. And so what herbs can do is they can, they can improve your body's ability to remove uh, these uh, uh, bacteria from your system. Uh, it's almost like they, they, they help to make them uh, slide out of your system, if you will. I mean, they, they don't kill them so much as they, 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 they try to keep them track in, in check and they prevent the, the uh, urinary tract, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, stinging sensation when you, when you urinate. So it's, it's good to take them even if you're taking an antibiotic for urinary tract infection, but you know if you're if you're willing to do it, if you drink plenty of uh, juice, cranberry juice with uh, uh, bearberry and lots of water to flush your kidneys, uh, that could be a very effective way to treat, a, especially a chronic problem. If you have a chronic problem where you have recurring infections, th that's the best time to use something like Kinnik Connect because that you know just using it once a day or maybe even only a couple times a week can be beneficial at preventing that infection from constantly recurring. Um, and one follow-up question that Barb had on there, um, do you know if there's bearberry on Europe Lake Road? Yes, that's where I, there is, it grows all along the road there. Cool. And uh, it, it grows, uh, right now it's, it's got a lot of berries on it too, in fact. She says, so. yippee. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Morgan, you said there was another question on Facebook. Right. Um, Mike asked, what are some good local sources for bittering agents? Well, I think, uh, I think dandelion, what I use a lot is dandelion root. If you take, you know, if you take dandelion root, it, it's very, it is very bitter if you just eat it straight. That, I mentioned how I, I also like to uh, roast it and that helps to bring out some of the sweetness. But if you what I, what I usually do is I take dandelion roots, chop them up, and I tincture them, and, and I usually use vodka. And again, since they're root, you have to let it sit for about four to six weeks. I, I go for the long end, usually six weeks, and shake them up every day. And then you can strain the, uh, the, the uh, roots out and just have the tincture. And then uh, the other thing, I, uh, the way I do it to make it taste a little bit better, because it is it's pretty bitter, not as bitter as some things, but is to take like, if you have some spearmint or mint and make a tincture out of that, and that one with a tincture with, a, with the leaves like that, you only need to let that sit in alcohol for a couple of weeks. But then if you combine those two tinctures together, then you have the mint as well as the, the bitters, uh, dandelion bitters. I also mentioned uh, the burdock root was a, was a good one. Um, but any, any plant that tastes bitter, has bitters in it. So, you know, most of the greens that uh, historically salads were bitter greens. 
and that would be like your dandelion leaf or uh, arugula, arugula is somewhat bitter. You know, th some of the other greens that, you know, that come up naturally early in spring, um, the, uh, uh, um, there's one that I just learned about, which is the uh, Dame's Rocket, which the greens are pretty, are, are, are edible, but they're, they're a little bit bitter. So, you know, salads t historically were made of bitter greens and were usually eaten after the main course, not before the main course, because that would, that would aid in digestion and the production of acid and enzymes. One of the things that bitters do is it increases, you know, you, you have taste, you have taste buds in your tongue that, that, uh, that can taste five different flavors, a sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, which is the, the savory flavor. And a lot of people never take anything bitter. So, but when you stimulate the bitter taste buds, sends a, it sends a signal to your digestive tract, hey, you know, it's time for digestion. And you could get, uh, you know, release of enzymes and acid that's needed for digesting meat. And so it, it, it's really um, a good thing to have to improve your digestion. And if you have a chronic digestive problem, I always recommend taking bitters, uh, a sh you know, you only need to take five to 10 drops or so. And if you don't like the taste, you can add dilute in a little bit of water. But it is important to taste it because the, you want to stimulate taste buds. And it, it take some bitters before every meal. And over a period of time, maybe several weeks, you'll find your digestion will return to normal. And it can really be good for treating things like ulcers and, and chronic digestive problems of all sorts. Bron um, ulcerative colitis, I think it's beneficial for, along with astringent herbs, you would want to get astringent herbs for that as well. Well, David, thank you so much. There's one last question. Um, do you offer classes or workshops? Um, well, uh, yeah, yes, I do. Um, one of the things I do during the summer, spring and summer, is I do herb walks. And um, I take people out to uh, different parts of, the, of Door County. Uh, like I usually start with one on Ellison Bluff because you know when the spring flowers are in, and so if people are interested in those, uh, if maybe Jess, if they send you their email address, uh, and you could forward that to me, I could put them on my list, and I can let them be tell, let them know when I'm going to be doing my herb walks. I also do uh, classes in the fall. One one I do uh, or in the, in the winter, I should say. One that I do is for the uh, 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 Door County Learning and Retirement Series that's out through, done through uh, UW Extension in Door County, in, in it's just in Sturgeon Bay. And the other one is the clearing. I do an herb class usually at the clearing. So um, those are the formal classes I have and, and people can sign up for those. But the herb walks are, are I think are, are really the best way because then we can get out into the find the plants you can you can see what they look like and you you know i can tell you about the plants right there and it's it's much more immediate i think than having a class well thank you so much dave one last comment is someone said great barb said great presentation so interesting we really appreciate you coming on and you know experiment experimenting with us and this whole online programming and thanks to oh, everybody welcome. that tuned in and thank you very much yeah, thank you. Uh, Morgan, do you have anything that you want to add at the end for other programs? Well, thank you for all for attending. Um, like Jess said, it's, it's all brand new to us and we're excited to reach out to everyone who um, is looking for some connection right now. So check um, both the library's Facebook page and also the Cress's Facebook page. Um, we're going to be having more events coming up. Um, next week is National Library Week, and so we're going to be celebrating um, with some information about the most banned books for 2019, and then we're also looking at starting a couple other presentations next week. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Okay, have a good Bye, day. Bye, guys. Everyone. Thank you.